Hello everyone, my name is Nathan and today it's time for another episode of Let's Make a Game. In the previous episode we established some kind of a debugging window which we can track in order to figure out what's going wrong in certain situations. And we also programmed in the ability to actually get rid of these objects by a middle mouse press. Now fiddling a little bit off camera with the code, I figured it might be a wiser idea to kind of do it differently. Another thing that I want to add is another tab right here with a miner. So we can actually have like resources on the floor such as coal, copper and iron and then we can place a miner on top of that and only on top of that. So I'm not sure if we get to that in today's episode. However, we're gonna clean up the code a little bit. I'm not going to show you everything. There might be a few things that I have changed and I don't remember. Sometimes it's hard to retrofit it for the episode. However, every fifth episode I will release all of the scripts I have so you can compare them in case you missed something. Anyways, let's get to the first part of this episode. I already created a few resource sprites. As you can see right here, we have some ore, coal, ore copper and ore iron. It's all the same sprite, just a little different color. We obviously also want these guys as a object and of course I already did that, assigning the right sprites to them. Nothing else is on those things just yet, they are just a pure object. What I also did is rename the object placement just as a side note. I gave it the addition one by one in order to indicate that there are going to be different object placement guys with bigger values such as 3 times 3 or so. However, that's not the point. What we want to do is have a look into the tile generation and add a little bit of code right here. And I would say we can do this right here right off the bat. What we want to go ahead and check is what is the current y position. The current x position we have already defined and I think current y can simply be equal to ii times global dot tile size, just like we did it before. Good, we're also gonna define another variable which is gonna be the ore spawn. So we are now adding to the tile generation in order to get some ore in the mix. It's still gonna be very simple and just a random thing, it's not gonna be the end tile generation, don't worry about that. The ore spawns is going to be a random number, let's say floor, which is a mathematical function to round it down to the next number. And we're going to choose a random number from 100. It's probably good to begin with and now we're going to start with another switch statement. We want to check the ore spawns, right? And now I want to basically define a 1% chance for any of the ores to appear. So we're gonna say in case the floor random 100 equals in 1, then we want an instance to be created at the current x and current y position. Of course you have to type it correctly, that would be advantageous. And what we want to spawn first is the object uh, actually or coal. Then we want to add a break because there could be the possibility that the number is gonna be 2, in which case we want to create another instance and this time I'm gonna copy it over. There we go, it should be the object or let's say copper. It's gonna be like the second most important thing to get in the beginning. And then also case 3, we want to define that with the last statement, which is gonna be the or iron of course. There we go, last break and I think that's all we have to add for this script. Let's check it out in the game. And of course I did something wrong. Ah, of course, I called this ore spawns, there we go. And there we go, we have all of the ores kind of evenly distributed and don't worry, that is definitely not the final ore generation, I just need them to be in the game for the time being. Okay, I'm glad we took care of that, however, now I want to change the behaviors of the belt placement and for that we will have to do a little bit of fiddling around with the code we already generated. However, it's going to be much easier in the end. The script we want to focus on first is going to be the object placement we made in one of the previous episodes. I'm not sure if I have shown you that yet, but I changed all the if-else statements into switch statements, which makes much more sense. So the rotation we don't really have to touch, we can actually leave that be. However, the follow statement we want to switch 
if you remember, we had all of these correctional variables in order to circumvent the fact that the image is rotating around the left top corner. So if I actually have a look at the object placement right here, you can see the point of origin is on the top left corner. And of course, if we had it in the dead center, we could rotate it around and it would actually remain at the cursor or at least at its current position. Unfortunately, not at the cursor. However, that's what we want to change. We want to change this into the center position and now it's in the dead center. We want to do that with the object itself as well. So center, there we go. And now that it is in the center, of course, all of these variables are not correct anymore. So we are going to get rid of everything before the move snap statement. We are going to get rid of that shebang here. And instead, we're going to do the good old x equals mouse x. Jeez, I cannot type today. And y equals mouse y. Great, now we are gonna run into various other problems, namely that the snap functionality is gonna snap us to the grid, which makes the individual tiles not actually remain in the grid. Yeah, look at that, it is still focusing on the same grid, however, but you can see it is totally out of alignment of the actual floor tiling that we have. However, it seems much easier to circumvent this issue than the other stuff that we did. I mean, I did a lot of corrections with the coordinates in the last episode, if you remember. So after we move snapped the thing, I thought we could simply move it again and then align it to the grid. So we are going to say x equals the current x value plus global dot tile size divided by 2 and y the same thing basically, global dot tile size divided by 2. Okay, now we have that. Let's check it out once again. Great, great, great. So now you can see, once again, we are within the grid with the ghost object. However, it is not aligning properly with the mouse. And that is a huge issue. This is actually the main reason I decided to go with my complicated solution. However, we can rotate stuff around as we please and we can place stuff as we please. And you can see the placing still works at the exact same spot where we have the actual ghost object. But this mouse thing is so confusing, so I thought we could maybe solve it differently. And if you have an even better solution, I'm eager to listen. However, what we are gonna do is simply hide the mouse button as long as we are using a ghost object. So we're gonna say window set cursor and we want this to be a cursor none, so it will basically remove the cursor completely. Then we also copy this over right here, so as soon as we get rid of an object, of a ghost object, we want to set the Windows cursor to an arrow. So basically the standard cursor again. Maybe eventually we're gonna have our own cursors, I don't know. But for now, that shall do the trick. And what we should be seeing now is the corrected version. However, I will take myself the liberty of copying this belt once again. And we want to paste that into the ghost object. So paste you right there. We're gonna remove this other ghost object that I had. And we are gonna do another change. Maybe a buttonized change. Something that is clearly visible because the ghost object was so faint that I was barely able to see it. So there we go. Let's test this out once again. Yeah, look at that. The cursor has disappeared and this makes a lot more sense. I can now place these belts just like that and it feels much more intuitive. And as soon as I get rid of it with Q, the cursor is back here and we don't have all of that confusion and can work with something much more simple. However, if I now click uh, one of these guys, you can see this is now totally out of alignment and that is something we will have to fix now, which we are of course going to do within the script remove objects. Right here we have all of these corrections, as you can see, this is so complicated and I had to think this all through and now I'm actually going to trash it all because we don't freaking need it anymore. So everything after draw self and before the mouse over check, we want to delete and we're going to do something else instead. We're going to say x1 is going to equal to x minus the sprite uh, width, I guess, divided by 2. And x2 is going to equal to x plus sprite width 
No, 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 hold the phone. Minus sprite width, I think. Minus sprite width divided by 2. Then y1 is going to equal to y minus sprite height divided by 2. And y2 is going to equal to y plus, no, minus sprite height divided by 2. There we go. And then the hx1, which is of course the health bar, if you remember, is gonna be x minus sprite width divided by 2. And the hx2 is gonna equal to x minus sprite width divided by 2. Last but not least, we have hy1, which is gonna be h plus sprite height no actually no 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 it's gonna be minus sprite height minus five no that can't be true it's divided by two minus five holy cow we will have to check if that is right i cannot think correctly anyways last but not least hx2 is gonna be equal to x minus sprite height no y of course it's gonna be y minus sprite height divided by 2. Oh man, hopefully that is going to be correct. No, you know what? I forgot a few things. For instance, right here, we are missing plus one sprite height. Yeah, we first have to go one sprite height up and then half a sprite height down. Or we could just say plus sprite height divided by 2. That makes more sense. Same thing right here. This should be a plus and then I guess those two things should be pluses as well. Okay, I think this is the final solution. We, we must try it. I'm so confused right now. We're gonna place a bunch of conveyor belts. There we go. And remove... Uh, yes, of course, Nathan. Write the variables the correct way, please. Okay, let's try this once again. Oh, yes. Okay, this seems to work. Just to be sure, is it pixel perfect? Yes, indeed. Great. Okay, we found the correct solution for that. And now it's going to be a lot easier to place these conveyor belts without any confusion. And we will have easier coding with all of the coordinates shebang. Cool stuff. So let me think whether or not we're going to do something else for today's episode. And also what it is going to be. I'll be right back. Okay guys, I thought there is not much sense in starting anything else in today's episode. I also realized this is the fifth episode, so therefore you will find in the description all of the scripts that I have right here. All of them, just like they are right now. In order to wrap this episode up, I thought we should have a look into the debug info and add some stuff here. Of course, what I would like to add is all of the ores to the GUI. Naturally, since they have a 1% chance of spawning, around 100 of each ores should spawn, theoretically. So I would say we're gonna set up all of the positions. Yeah, let's do the positions first here. We're gonna need one for coal, copper and iron. So that's three, four and five. And this we have to change as well. So it's actually going to the next line. And also I think I like to have one more pixel of distance in between the lines. Now we are of course also gonna copy over all of these positions. This should be three, four and five. And we have to change all of that shebang. So this was or coal. And I want to stay true to my naming. This way you never get confused. This is the copper and then we have Finally, the iron. Cool. And of course, we also want to change that within the object's name. So that's what I'm doing right now. And or iron. There we go. What else do we have to change? These positions, of course. And last but not least, what they are called. So here we're gonna have the coal ore. This time we can use normal language. The copper ore. And finally, the iron ore. Copy this variable over and we should be done with the conversion of these statements. And therefore we should also be seeing the right information, this blade on the right side. And there we go. Yeah, look at that. About 100 of each ore. And of course we can increase the frequency of each individual ore as we please. Oh guys, there's actually one more thing that I forgot to do. Yeah, right here. This statement we can make a lot, lot easier. I actually could remember the statement I was looking for. 
Maybe some of you also commented in the comment section. I actually pre-recorded this episode. This is like you are seeing episode number two while I'm recording this one. So what we can simply do if we tap the tap key, we want to change the state of the global debug info, no matter if it is true or false, it should be the other thing. So we can say global.debug info equals to not global.debug info. And this will simply change it from one state to the other. If it is false, it will be true. If it is true, it will be false. Simple as that. Great stuff. Now I can go to rest and wrap up this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great time. And hopefully I'm gonna catch you in the next one. Bye bye.